Welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Dr. Shati Vishesh from the Department of Islamic History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Today we are going to discuss from the paper Economic History of India, the module Mughal Empire, Trade and the Monetary System. In this module, we will try to learn the inland trade during the Mughals, overland trade during the Mughals, foreign trade during the Mughals, and the relation of the state and the commerce. Now let us discuss the inland trade. During the Mughal period, agriculture flourished in a big way. And as a result of it, the surplus production had to be somehow brought to the market and into the business. Now, inland trade began with this, with the basic of the supplying of food grains and other stuff to the towns and cities. And we also have to understand that during the medieval period, towns and cities also grew in number. The trade was controlled by the village banias or merchants or the banjaras who were involved in the long distant merchants and supplied the stuff to the mandis or local markets. So it was a flow of the food grains from the village to the market in the hands of either the banyas or the small merchants or the banjaras who worked in a group. In a village mandi, the villagers sold their products and bought stuff which were not available locally like metalwork, salt and spices. So it was a kind of an exchange from the village to the cities and vis-a-vis. -vis. The village elites at this point of the time also bought luxury items from the village mandis because they had the requisite money to buy the stuff. Regional specialization in certain products led to intra-regional exchange during this time. The Banjaras or long distance traders specialized in carrying bulk goods. Food grains, pulses, ghee and salt were the most common items that they carried. So there was within the trade network a system where one stuff you could go from one region to the other very easily and smoothly. Expensive goods were also catered to the market by them and especially the textiles and the silk textiles were carried on camel back and mule or even in carts. The movement of goods through rivers was always cheap and much preferred. The waterways and coastal transport was much developed. It carried heavier goods even in transit. The most popular items for inter-regional transport were food grains and textiles. Bengal transported huge amount of food grains, silk, sugar and muslin to the northern states and even sometimes to the southern coast. The coast of Coromandel, which produced textile, had direct links with Gujarat, which, was a, which had some very popular international ports. And it also carried the goods to the Deccan ports. Gujarat, on the other hand, was an entry point for the foreign goods. It sent fine textiles and silks like patola to North India. Gujarat received food grains from Bengal and pepper from Malabar. From the accounts of the travelers during this time, we have a vivid description of the items that were sent from Gujarat and the items that was received in the ports of Gujarat. Bengal was supplied fine silk, North India supplied indigo food grain and had a great market for luxury goods. So therefore, the time was congenial for the expansion of market, the network of roads improved and what really happened was people had the capacity, at least the upper echelon of the society, to buy items and exchange goods. So on a whole, in North India, as well as in Central, Western and Eastern India, the network was congenial for Indian trade. Lahore was a center of production of handicrafts. Handicrafts at this point of time 
flourished in an innumerable way because it was considered to be a part of the luxury items that was consumed by the medieval elites. The handicrafts made in Lahore was also very popular outside India. The products from Kashmir were sorted out in areas of Lahore. Likewise, the products of Punjab moved to Sindh via Kabul and Kandahar on their one way and then it could also move to Delhi and Agra. So Lahore essentially was a point where handicraft goods were displayed and then it was disputed. The trade network of luxury items and semi-luxury items had a great network. The two nodal points were definitely Agra and Burhanpur. In the late 18th century, where, when Banaras came up as an important area, Agra to some extent lost its earlier shine. Lahore had the advantage of sending goods down to Indus while Delhi and Agra had the Yamuna River to communicate. The network linked the merchants with the peasants along with the wholesalers with merchants down the, to the region and local levels through agents called gumastas or commission agents or dalals. These two terms, of course, we have to understand had a previous origin. Now, they were considered as, together as a bulk or good of the commission agents and later again they became the money lenders in the post Mughal era. The Dutch and the English record knows that in Gujarat, the traders were very active and alert in the 17th century. There was keen competition for inside information and whenever there was a demand for good, it was supplied. So the market had the viability of competition because at this point, even within the inland trade, the foreign companies had started showing their interest. The inland trade was connected via roads, which were much improved after the legacy of Sher Shah. We have to understand the concept of network of road was much improved by Sher Shah's five years rule. The transport arrangement also included the Sarais. About, and it, the Sarais were located eight to ten miles at a distance in the highway and it connected usually the important centers. Sarai is a concept which was essentially medieval. Caravan Sarais have been referred by many travelers who visited India during this time. Tavania especially appreciated the system and noted that horses were also used for mounds while oxen, mules and camels were used for carrying goods. In a normal day, 8 to 10 miles distance could be covered, proving that the roads and the facilities in the roads were good. Now, considering the time, 8 to 10 miles is supposedly a faster communication time period. Pack oxen, ox-drawn carts and camels were the chief means of transport. Horses were also used as mounts. Palanquin was used by upper classes with the help of four men and two relievers could easily travel to 120 to 130 miles. But usually that was not the means of communication. On normal day's journey, according to the contemporary writers, con covered about 8 to 12 miles, which was again, compared to the medieval times of Europe, was faster. Now, let us move to a very interesting concept of hundi. Hundi does have its ancient background, but as, uh, as trade flourished during medieval period, the concept of hundi became all the more popular. The movement of goods was facilitated by this easy transmission of money called hundi. Hundi was kind of a letter of a credit payable after a period of time at a discount. The hundis often included insurances or what we call bima, which was charged at different rates based on the value of the good and the mode of the transportation. Hundi was usually uh, issued by big merchant called sarafs 
uh, and Sarabs became later a group of uh, merchants and then it tended to become a caste in the medieval period. They supplemented the money in circulation and finance business, especially the long distance and international business. The nobles also sometimes used the hundis for giving salaries to their soldiers. So the banking system as such was a very improved structure during this period. Now let us move to foreign trade. Now India had a legacy of foreign trade and what happened during the Mughals is or rather it carried the legacy from the ancient times to the Delhi Sultanate and then but during the Mughals as India was part of the Islamic aid culture for a long time it could connect to West Asia, North Africa, Europe and through to Southeast Asia and China through roads and waterways. Now overseas trades in during this time saw the appearance of the Portuguese especially in the end of the 15th century. Now they traded in spices, armaments and horses and tried to monopolize the business. They had a traditional rivalry with the Muslim merchants but of course in the competitive market also became rivals to the Indian market. This somehow did not continue for long and by the middle of the 16th century adjustments of, had to be made with, between the Asian traders and the Portuguese because the Portuguese also understood that the bulk of trade could not be handled by them single-handedly. The process of excluding the Moors or the Arab merchants in particular and the Muslim merchants in general by the Portuguese did continue for long but it was not entertained by any of the rulers in India. The Portuguese introduced the system of Karthas or the permission. Now this was a permission that was granted by the Portuguese for easy access to the water. We have to understand that at this point of time, Portuguese were the only group of merchants who controlled armed ships. The passes though were given very liberally because it was part of their business. This kind of customs income became a major source of the Portuguese revenue and they did not change the established pattern of trade. Now it is observed that between 16th and 18th century India's overseas trade increasingly uh, increased steadily but of course we have to understand the involvement of the Indian merchants could not be counted. It is true that the bulk of the trade increased but the bulk of the trade increased because of the involvement of the merchants from West Asia, Central Asia and Europe. The expansion of the bulk good happened along with the extent of area too. So Indian merchants now because of the uh, because of the appearances of the European ships could travel up to Europe and then up to China. This change happened due to the presence of the English, Dutch and the French trading companies. The other factor that is important for this expansion was the rise of the Ottomans, the Safavids and the Mughals. These two mighty empires gave the security that was much needed in the, in, in the land of Asia and also the tra ocean trade. Now the role of the Ming dynasty is also very important in this regard. We have to understand that China was a potential contributor to this trade and the, and the connect of the Asian waters was between China and Europe where India played a vital strategic role. The Ming dynasty itself had a direct link with the Koromandol and the other parts of India. The law and order established by these empires made the whole of Asian congenial for trade and commerce. Added to these were the facilities that were 
that was introduced by these empires and the urban the concept of urbanization that developed because of the empire building process and monetization on the other hand both are rather all these three empires introduced standardized coins which were much in circulation and the circulation definitely was very fast and congenial for the trade. Control over trade and trade routes became a vital issue in the contemporary politics and we see that all these three empires getting into this politics. The overland trade also expanded at this point of time. Again, we have to understand the history of overland trade goes back to the ancient times. What really happened during this time is because of the development of law and order, or the, rather the improvement of law and order, the overland trade, the ancient overland trade revived at this point of time. The route covered Baghdad and Baghdad was well connected to the port of Sharaf via Shiraz. The caravans thus coming from Iran, India, Central Asia and China followed the same route over centuries to reach Baghdad. The main highland divided from Nishapur. One went to China via Merv and Bukhara and the other moved to Mul Multan via Herat and Kandahar. India was part of this second route. The road reaching to China was known as the Silk Route. Silk though was not the main bulk of trade anymore at this point of time. During this time the main bulk of uh, trade was done in porcelain and carpets along with certain Chinese silk in small portion. This road was popular for horses, also jade and few silk items which were not produced in, in, in parts of India. The southern road that connected India was popular for cotton textile which reached West Asia and Central Asia via this road. It is believed that it even reached Russia. This route terminated at Aleppo in Ottoman Turkey where it is believed and it is reported by the chroniclers that many Indians lived in Aleppo. Indian merchants settled all over this place. Though with the decline of Buddhism we understand the route to Xinjiang was dominated by Iranians, Turks and Mongols and Indians lost their share in this route. The Indian merchants could be found in pockets like Yarkhan and Khotan till 19th century, at least in the British records says so, to look after the trade of commerce from Punjab to Central Asia and China across Ladakh and Kashmir. In West Asian ports, towns like Bandar Abbas and Mocha's huge population of Indians were found. The Indian merchants spread to Balk, Bukhara and Samarkand. Even in the Russian region of Baku, Astrakhan, Jaroslav and Moscow, Indian merchants were found. The fall of the Safavid and the Mughal Empire and the debasement of the currency though gave a serious blow to the position of the merchants in all these places. The Indian business of course was started on a family basis. So apart from that, they also had individual contributors. They sometimes worked even in collaboration with the local merchants. This trend was useful in areas where the, there was a capital scarcity. And usually the income or rather the profit was shared between the merchants of the homeland and the Indian merchants. The Indian textile gave the edge to the Indian merchants over others. Indian merchants also used to lend money over an interest and at times was accused of being usurers. Indians also did business in indigo, sugar and spices. The, con the business of indigo and sugar did have its background during the Delhi Sultanate. The imports included horses, silver, carpets, fur, dry fruits and some spices. India have 
have to happen to be the largest consumer at that point of time of silver because the currency of the Mughals depended on the supply of sil valid silver. The balance of trade with Russia, Syria and Persia was also very favorable. The bulk of goods in difficult to estimate but it is true that Mughal mints in Multan, Kashmir, Kabul and Lahore and Thatta produce at most 36.7% in the 16th, 17th century and thus the huge amount of trade could be envisaged. The Mughals carried the legacy of Central Asia and Timur and therefore when we have to we have to evaluate Mughal state and commerce, we have to keep in mind that the Mughals continued in this tradition. But of course, we have to understand they never had an imperial policy. And it was an individual interest of the royals which involved in this commerce. The Mughals on their onset tried to control areas of Gujarat, Bengal and Sindh as they, these were the principal ports at during that time. But of course, again to repeat that it never became an imperial policy. The overland towns of Kabul and Kandahar always remained within the grip of the Mughals. Now, there was an unhealthy trend where the nobles tried to monopolize trade of some good. It is recorded that from the time of Akbar up to the time of Bahadur Shah Zafar, if all the emperors tried to control this practice of sing single nobles getting involved in trade and monopolizing trade. The royal family was involved in a great way into ships, the business of shipbuilding and then lending these ships for business was a profitable income for the royal family. The shipbuilding industry of course was not very remarkable at that point of time because we have to understand that by that time Europeans already entered the scenario with better ships. The royal family invested in it. This was congenial for the trade and created more space for the Indian traders. The competition for foreign, uh, rather the freight traffic had risen because of the English and the Dutch appearing in the scenario. So the Indian traders had to split their good to the Indians and the European ships. The investment, uh, of course, was again more beneficial to uh, the royals uh, rather the merchants when the royals got involved because the royal facilitated their route for advances from the mints. The huge agrarian surplus at least that was extracted from the common people got some kind of a routing into converting it into commercial capital. Free trade regulation of the Mughal state and control of the trade by communities and caste was the key feature at that point of time. So it was always the tendency of the, uh, the rulers, uh, rather the Mughal rulers, not to get involved in the caste-based society and even the caste-based business. Interestingly, as a group, they were involved in affairs of the government for the sake of business. So the merchants had a great control in some of the vineyard points of the Mughal Empire. The Mughals did not believe in administrative trade, though they at times tried to monopolize the trade of certain goods and it is believed that Shah Jahan has the most interest in monopolizing certain goods. But their effort did not do well. It is also recorded in Shah Jahan Nama that his involvement in indigo trade and trying to monopolize it from the ports of Gujarat failed in many of ways. The major effort of the Mughal state, however, was the trade to be kept free and sea route open to their merchants. The Mughals never had a navy and therefore they could not save the Indian merchants from the Europeans at any point of time. So the Indian merchants had to compete with 
the European merchants on their own. The balance thus that they had with the European companies was very weak and survived till the state became weak. Now the lacuna of the, this commerce uh, that was controlled by the Mughals is that the custom duty that they levied was very, very low and due to political situation had to give concession and this later became a major problem. The last blow was given by Farooq Seer who gave a kind of a firman to the English where the English trading became absolutely free. So compared to the English, the Indian merchants were at a disadvantage. The growth of piracy and lack of the naval force made the Mughal involvement in trade and commerce all the more vulnerable. Neither the Mughals could save their own ships or the ships that were controlled by the Indian merchants. The Indian ships also were not properly armed compared to the arms and ammunitions that were kept in the Portuguese ships and later in the English and the Dutch ships, which were much, much more lighter, Indian ships failed to control the waters. Deccan was never really uh, controlled by the Mughals, so there was no need for them to, or rather they never felt the need to have a big navy. The Mughals produced finest currency in the contemporary world. So if we have to look into the trade of this time, we also have to, and have to get an idea about the monetary system that the Mughals introduced. It was, a, it was a perfect system compared to the Safavids and the Ottomans and the contemporary European empires. The Mughals has the best quality of coins. Traditionally also we have to understand the concept of good standardized coins was actually brought into this country by the Delhi Sultanate rulers. It was perfect in uniformity and purity. It was a trimetallic currency and the silver rupee was the basic coin and medium of exchange. We again have to repeat that silver was not found in India and we always had to import silver for this uh, currency. During the time of Shetra, the money in circulation was called Sikandari. It was a copper coin with a dash of silver alloy, which was developed after the debasement of the silver tanka of the Delhi Sultanate. The silver tanka has its own descendants in the Muzaffaris of Malwa and the Mahmudis of Gujarat. So every region had its own variety at one point of time. The Dakkan sultans also coined tankas. The coinage of Vijayanagar Empire was based on Hoon or Pagoda or a gold coin. After the disintegration of the Vijayanagar Empire, these coins were produced by the Qutub Shahis of Golconda and the other southern principalities. Shesha tried to produce coins without any element of debasement. Thus, he could produce silver rupiah or rupee together with coins of pure gold and copper. But this system operated only for about three years. Now, this system was then firmly established by none other than Akbar. The basic rupiah weighed 178 gram grain troys in which the alloy was never allowed to rise above 4%. This coin was issued even by the successors though they also tried to introduce a slightly heavier rupee during the time of Jahangir. The attempt was definitely short-lived. The rupee weight was finally raised by Aurangzeb to 180 grain troys. We have to understand that Aurangzeb was actually covering a larger part of the empire. The silver rupee became the base of exchange and tax payment. The Mughals also issued a gold coin or called, which is called the Ashrafi or Mohar, which weighed 169 grain troy and this was essentially used for holding purposes. The coin was practically of unalloyed metal. For small exchange, there were of course 
copper coins called dam which was 323 grains. In 1663-64, Aurangzeb was faced with a scarcity of gold and this replaced the dam, the older dam with a newer one which had, which was about two-thirds of its waste. So we have understand that whenever there was an economic crisis, some way or the other, the monetary system had to be operated in a different fashion and the rulers were at least aware enough to control this and keep a standard of the coins and its uniformity. The Mughal issued the coins from large number of mints throughout the empire. In 1595, which were the heydays of Akbar, there were about 42 mints producing copper coins. Rupee was for, uh, produced in 14 mints and Mohar was produced not less than about 4 mints. The rupee producing mints rose to 40 during Aurangzeb. This was due to the expansion again of the empire. Interestingly, the uniformity was maintained throughout the empire. It was an open bullion concept where anyone can bring an amount of uh, metal to the mint and that could be converted to coins. This cost, of course, had to be given, which was again about 5.6 of the value of the coins minted. When a treasury issued coins, it deduced 5% and this system of deducing the 5% is called, called Dodami. And throughout the uh, Mughal Empire, from its start till end, this Dodami remained 5%. In the same kind of rule prevailed again in case of gold and copper coins. Theoretically, the value of the coin should have equal to its weight in bullion added to it the cost of minting. In reality, the newly minted coins carried higher value because of the time that is to uh, took to get bullion converted into pieces at the mints. Discounts were given on the basis of the age. So older coins had to be reduced in their value. Coins bore the name of the mint and the year of the issue which was basic. If it was a newly minted coin, it was usually called Taza Sikka. The older coins were called Chalanis and the previous era coins were called the Khazanas will again had to be accepted on a larger discount. The discount did not exceed the minting cost. The coins which lost in weight were accepted on the value of their weight in bullion. So let's move to the mints now. Uh, as the coinage was free, the value of coins in relation to each other varied according to the values of gold, silver, copper from the time uh, from, for every era. The value of rupee was 40 dam during Akbar's period, but the value of change as copper appreciated in its value. This led to the conversion of uh, it to a mere notional fraction unit of the rupee having no relation to the dam coin. The fractional piece of the rupee then came into existence and was called an anna which was a 1 16th of a rupee and we have to understand that this concept was carried up to the British period. This came in use generally during the time of Shah Jahan. The change was accompanied by the fact that rupee became the medium of exchange and the principal exchange medium during Akbar was the tanka or the double dam or the ordinary dam. The prices in the next century was quoted in rupee. This process can be seen in the land deeds and the land right papers. Otherwise, we do not have the reference of it anywhere else. The concept of dam being the exchange medium was there in the 1580s. The first appearance of the rupee in the sale document came in 1592-93, again during the time of Akbar. Of course, in Gujarat ports, Mahmudi, the old coins minted by the sultans of Gujarat, continued to be used as per the chroniclers. So we have to understand that apart from the Mughal's coin, other coins which were standardized was also in use. 
As the Mughal authority dominated the Deccan, the rupee also became popular there. And with the expansion of uh, the empire during Aurangzeb into Bijapur and Golconda, this facilitated the use of rupee. More mints in South India uh, produced these coins and then it was able to uh, replace the Hun or the Pagoda. Copper coinage was now only used for petty payments. For smaller payments, we had something called cowries and it was very popular in the uh, coastal regions of Bengal and Orissa. The value of one rupee would be around 2,500 cowries. Of course, the rate fluctuated. In Gujarat, imported almonds were used for the same purpose like the cowries were used in Bengal. In the larger transaction, coinage was replaced by credit money. So hundis, as we have referred to them earlier, was also in use and kept the circulation of money fast. The information regarding the exchange of these hundis of coins is given in a detailed, uh, in a contemporary work, Mirat al Ahmadi in 1761. In 1651 in Agra, the deduction amount was about 1%. In 1751, the Sarafs and the big merchant who issues hundis rose the price to 8% and there was a big, huge upheaval because of this. So it could be understood that hundis were much in use, otherwise this kind of replications would not have happened. The Sarafs also ex uh, accepted deposits at interest. This developed later into a credit money. The money in circulation was determined essentially by the number of rupee coins minted. The Mughal coinage was free, thus the amount of money in circulation was determined always by the amount of silver that was imported. The 17th, 18th century saw the influx of silver from Spanish mines uh, through, uh, from the new world and obviously one of the big consumers was India. The basic monetary system was based therefore on free currency but in general the standard was uniform and high that was controlled by the imperial Mughals. So now let us summarize as to what we have done in this module. The, it was a time when trade flourished it was also a time when trade became competitive and the Europeans appeared in the scenario. The Mughals did not have any imperial policy and failed to give protection to the merchants and ultimately they lost to the Europeans. Added to this flourishing trade, the monetary system was a boost and it introduced standardized trimetallic coins. The monetary system was excellent therefore and gave boost to trade and commerce at least in the high uh, ages of the medieval period that was controlled by the Mughals. By this uh, discussion, uh, I presume that we have been able to communicate how trade flourished during this period and the trade and commerce became competitive with the advent of the Europeans and the Mughals did ha not have an imperial policy and therefore they failed to give protection to the merchants. The monetary system introduced was standardized trimetallic coins and the monetary system was excellent and gave boost to the trade and commerce in general. For more information and references, please go and refer to the e-text given along. Thank you.